Hi, welcome back to the channel. This video is another update on the situation in Turkey. And today we're looking at Fitch, the rating agency, who have just updated their rating for the Turkish risk. And it's been downgraded, as you might expect, given everything that's going on in Turkey. So in this video, I wanted to run you through the rating that Fitch have now given to Turkey, who Fitch are and what rating agencies do and why they're important in the general scheme of things. This isn't just a commentator. It's not like a press article on Turkey that's making comments on what they think about the risk of Turkey going forward. This is actually really important in terms of sovereign debt and bonds issued by the country and just the general appetite for everybody to take on debt from Turkey. So it is really important. And what I wanted to do is give you a better understanding as to what the rating agency has said, who they are, and what the perspective is. So before we get into all of that, if you could give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, I'd really appreciate it. And please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And don't forget that I include chapters in these videos. So if there's a section that you're not particularly interested in, it's really easy to skip forward onto the next one. The rating agencies are independent bodies who have analysts who review companies and also countries and issue ratings based on their assessment as to what they believe is the risk profile of that company or country. And internationally, there are three major rating agencies that everybody looks to for these official ratings. And they are Moody's, Standard and Poor's, often referred to as S&P, and Fitch. Standard and Poor's is officially the oldest of the three rating agencies and was established in 1906 as the Standard Statistics Bureau. It later acquired Poor's Publishing in 1941 and the new name of Standard and Poor's was put in place at that time. Moody's was established by John Moody in 1909 and Fitch was established in 1914 by John Fitch. Today, all three rating agencies are seen as having similar credibility and the only key difference between the three is the companies and countries that they cover because they don't all cover everything. And the key function and the main reason why rating agencies are really important today relate to debt. So all bonds that are issued look to have an official rating. It helps them to sell the bond. And a lot of funds will only take on bonds that have an official rating from one of these agencies. And many of the funds will only take on investment grade bonds. So that is the highest level of rating that you can achieve. And there's different levels within investment grade. So generally there are four different categories of investment grade. And as long as a bond is rated in those four categories, then any fund can take on that bond. As and when a bond starts to deteriorate in terms of its risk profile, then the rating agencies will change their rating. And if a bond moves from investment grade to non-investment grade, then that often means that a fund can no longer hold that bond. And that's when we see bonds starting to be sold in the secondary market as a pension fund or another fund may decide that they want to dispose of that credit risk and replace it with another investment grade bond. So the rating agencies hold a really important part in the whole of the financial structure. They're doing a lot of work for the fund managers. They are constantly looking at what's going on within a company. So they'll look at what's happening with regards to their sales and their forecasts and what's happening in the market and what's happening with regards to competition. And so they're constantly adjusting their ratings based on company specific factors but they're also looking at the wider environment. So they may be looking at what's happening with regards to that sector that that company operates within. And if the sector is starting to deteriorate or it's becoming more difficult to operate in that sector or the raw materials are rising in price or other factors are affecting that sector, then they may downgrade the company based upon the sector. And they'll also look 
uh, country and geopolitical factors. So if a company is based in a particular country or has a lot of manufacturing in a country where there are political risks, for example, then they may downgrade that company. So as an example, if you had a mining company and it had mines in a country where there was a civil war, then that company could get downgraded because the supply of materials from that mine may be affected by what's happening with regards to the military conflict. So there's a number of different factors that the rating agencies include in their analysis of every company. And they regularly publish updated reports and ratings for all companies. And when there is a change in the rating, this impacts not only on the existing bonds that a company has in the market, but also the ability to raise new bonds. And that's a really important factor. So if a company is downgraded from investment grade to non-investment grade, then that will mean that if they want to issue new bonds, then firstly, the price will go up because issuing as a non-investment grade issuer is more expensive because the risk is higher and therefore you have to compensate anybody who wants to take on your bond with a higher coupon. But it would also make it more difficult because there are less buyers of non-investment grade bonds. For exactly the same reason we just talked about, a lot of the funds are unable to buy non-investment grade bonds. It's not part of their strategy. So a higher risk bond will have a much smaller market and therefore will be more difficult to place. And this is one of the issues that we've talked about a lot on this channel with regards to the Chinese property developers. A lot of these developers started off as investment grade. They were seen as being really good credit risks and not an area where you were ever going to lose any money. And as the market has started to unwind and as the problems have started to come out, we've seen most of the Chinese property developers move from investment grade to non-investment grade. And that's now causing a massive problem in the market because they've got hundreds of billions of dollars of bonds that are maturing and they're unable to refinance them. So they can't issue new bonds to pay off the old bonds because the credit risk is now too high and nobody wants to buy them. So the rating agencies are really important because they are basically telling the market how risky a company or a country is. And if they downgrade a company or a country, then it becomes less attractive to the market and it makes it a lot more difficult for that company or country to raise new debt in the future. Fitch has 11 different ratings that it applies to borrowers. So let's run through all of those ratings and have a quick look at the definition of each. So the highest rating that Fitch gives is triple A. This is the highest credit quality that you can achieve. And it's defined as being the lowest expectation of default risk. They are assigned only in cases of exceptionally strong capacity for payment of financial commitments. The capacity is highly unlikely to be adversely affected by foreseeable events. So that is the holy grail for all companies. If you can achieve AAA status, then that is going to be the lowest possible cost in the market and the easiest way to be able to raise that money. Next is AA, which is very high credit quality and denotes expectations of very low default risk. They indicate very strong capacity for payment of financial commitments and the capacity is not significantly vulnerable to foreseeable events. So not quite as good as AAA, but still highly desirable and will result in a low cost of borrowing for the company or country. The third level of investment grade rating is single A. And single A is defined as a capacity for payment of financial commitments to be considered strong. This capacity may nevertheless be more vulnerable to adverse business or economic conditions than in the case for higher ratings. So we're starting to see some elements of risk coming in to the single A rating. And the final rating that sits within the investment grade bracket is triple B. And triple B is defined as expectations of default risk currently low. Capacity for payment of financial commitments is considered adequate, but adverse business or economic conditions are more likely to impair this capacity. So we're starting to get to the point where there is a risk of this business being affected by wider economic and business related factors. So it could become non-investment grade. The highest level of non-investment grade category is double B. And double B is classified as indicating an elevated vulnerability to default risk 
particularly in the event of adverse changes in business or economic conditions over time. However, business or financial flexibility exists that supports the servicing of financial commitments. So this rating is not a death sentence. It's still okay, but there are some more risks associated than any of the investment grade ratings. Next on the list is single B, which is described as highly speculative and indicates that material default risk is present, but a limited margin of safety remains. Financial commitments are currently being met. However, capacity for continued payment is vulnerable to deterioration in the business and economic environment. Next on the list is triple C, or the hooks, the three hooks as this is referred to. And this is substantial credit risk. And the definition is very low margin for safety. Default is a real possibility. So triple C is sitting just above the default ratings. And once you're getting to this level, there is a high risk that the company is going to get into financial difficulty. Double C is defined as very high level of credit risk. Default of some kind appears probable. Single C is near default. A default or default-like process has begun, or the issuer is in standstill, or for a closed funding vehicle, payment capacity is irrevocably impaired. RD is restricted default and defined as a company that has experienced an uncured payment default or distressed debt exchange on a bond loan or other material financial obligation, but has not entered into bankruptcy filings, administration, receivership, liquidation or other formal winding up procedure and has not otherwise ceased operating. And finally, we've got D, which is default and indicates an issuer that in Finch's opinion has entered into bankruptcy filings, administration, receivership, liquidation or other formal winding up procedure or that has otherwise ceased business. So let's have a look at the report that Fitch have just released on Turkey. So as you can see, Fitch have reduced the rating from double B minus to single B plus, and their outlook is negative for Turkey. If we look at some of the specifics in their report here, the downgrade of Turkey's issuer default rating and the negative outlook reflects the following key rating drivers and their relative weights. Policy driven financial stress episodes of higher frequency and intensity have increased Turkey's vulnerabilities in terms of high inflation, low external liquidity and weak policy credibility. Fitch does not expect the authorities' policy response to reduce inflation, including FX protected deposits, targeted credit and capital flow measures will sustainably ease macroeconomic and financial stability risks. So this is basically referring to Turkey's counterintuitive policies of reducing interest rates at the time of high inflation. General economic theory tells you that at high inflation periods, you should increase interest rates to reduce people's appetite for spending and therefore bring prices back down. Turkey are following the opposite approach and obviously Fitch do not buy into this concept. Fitch have gone on to say, that Turkey's expansionary policy mix, including deeply negative real rates, could entrench inflation at high levels, increase the exposure of public finances to exchange rate depreciation and inflation, and eventually weigh on domestic confidence and reignite pressures on internal reserves. The risk of additional destabilizing monetary policy, easing or stimulus policies ahead of the 2023 general elections is high. And there's an elevated degree of uncertainty about the authorities' policy reaction function in the event of another episode of financial stress as political considerations limit the central bank's ability to raise its policy rate. So what Fitch is saying here is that it's concerned that political issues are more important than the economic focus of bringing down inflation. They believe that the upcoming election and the general focus for President Erdogan to make sure that he remains in power could mean that the policies that are being used right now are detrimental to the growth of Turkey. So they are concerned that politics are overtaking the economics in this situation. And that's one of the reasons that they have a negative outlook for Turkey over the next 12 months or so. Fitch have gone on to make statements about the new policies that have been brought in to bring in foreign currency. 
They said that the Turkish authorities expect that the introduction of FX-protected deposits, combined with a broader strategy to encourage liraization of the financial system, will support exchange rate stability and in turn facilitate a reduction in inflationary pressures. The new mechanism, expanded from retail depositors to corporates, non-residents and Turkish citizens abroad, will compensate term deposit holders if the lira depreciation is greater than the nominal interest rate. As of 9th of February, FX protected deposits were 313 billion Turkish lira, 5.8% of total deposits, and corporates are expected to increase participation due to tax benefits. In Fitch's view, the new instrument's capacity to sustainably improve confidence is limited in an environment of high and rising inflation, as well as unanchored expectations. Moreover, if the instrument fails to reduce domestic demand for FX, preserving a stable exchange rate without the use of interest rates would require renewed FX intervention or additional capital flow measures similar to those recently introduced requiring the sale of 25% of exporters' revenues, as well as tighter controls to monitor that credit allocations do not add to FX demand. This policy response could in turn have a negative effect on domestic confidence. So Fitch, are, so Fitch are basically saying here that they do not believe that the protected deposit schemes are going to work. They're not going to raise enough capital. And also the confidence factor in the lira is the key issue here. And they are questioning whether or not this has solved that confidence factor. And Fitch are indicating that they believe that further support will be required in the currency markets to maintain the value of the lira. And that, of course, is very expensive to the Turkish authorities and is a big problem for them because they don't have very much in terms of foreign currency reserves left. The final issue that we'll touch on here from this report is inflation. Now, Fitch have stated that inflation rose to 48% in January and price pressures remain high with producer price index close to 94%, partly reflecting international commodity prices and supply chain disruptions. Continued exchange rate pass-through, rising inflation expectations and utility price and wages hikes. We forecast inflation to reach 38% by the end of the year, an average 41% in 2022 and 28% in 2023 the second highest among all Fitch-rated sovereigns. Backward indexation, failure of the authorities to rein in expectations and additional exchange rate volatility represent risks to our inflation forecasts. So Fitch are basically saying here that they expect inflation to remain extremely high in Turkey over the next two years. Rates of 41% and 28% are still unbelievably high and not sustainable. It's not possible to operate normal policies in light of those levels of inflation. And the problem that we've got is that the Turkish authorities are also operating this contrarian view where they are trying to reduce interest rates at the time of extremely high inflation. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, Fitch have really confirmed a lot of what we've been talking about on this channel. We all know what the issues are in Turkey right now. They've got runaway inflation. It's touching 50% right now, and it's not expected to come down anytime soon. Fitch are forecasting an average rate of inflation for the whole of 2022 of 41%. And when you've got that level of inflation, it's really difficult to be able to manage the country effectively. And Fitch have downgraded the rating from double B to single B. So it was already non-investment grade and classified as junk, but it's now even higher junk status. We're one above triple C, which is basically into default territory. So Fitch have primed everybody that Turkey is now sitting just above default status and with a negative outlook for the next year, it's likely that they will be moved into a default situation. And that's really important because we've got a huge amount of Turkish sovereign debt that needs to be refinanced in 2022. Fitch have estimated that Turkey has $167 billion worth of bonds that need to be renewed during the year. And as they downgrade the rating, it's going to be more expensive for Turkey to refinance those bonds, 
But more importantly, it might be impossible because they're moving deeper into non-investment grade territory. They're almost at default level. And if they hit default, it will be impossible for Turkey to be able to renew those bonds. In a normal set of circumstances, what would happen is when those bonds come up for renewal, Turkey would issue new bonds and use the money raised from the new bonds to pay off the old bonds. If you're classified as being an in default in terms of your rating, then it won't be possible to raise those new bonds and therefore you'll have maturing bonds that you can't afford to repay and you will be in an actual default. And this is what we've been talking about on the channel for some time, that Turkey looks like it's heading into a default and it will probably need to have some form of bailout, either from the IMF or the World Bank or some other international agency. Now, President Erdogan won't want to do that. He doesn't want to be classified as being in default and he won't want to have any form of bailout. But the rating agencies are all expecting that to happen. They're downgrading the status of Turkey and that means that their bonds are becoming more expensive and less attractive. So it is starting to hit them in terms of their international position. This is something that is going to be a major problem for Turkey in the very short term. In the next three to six months, we're likely to see Turkey downgraded to default status and therefore all of these bonds are at risk of not being able to be refinanced. So hopefully you found this video interesting. I wanted to go into a bit more depth about what the rating agencies are, how they go about looking at businesses and countries and why they're important in the general scheme of things, why you should care about Fitch and their ratings. Hopefully you've got a better understanding now than you did at the start of the video. If you've liked what I've said today, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.